God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things. This is Brother Hutchings inviting the listeners to a, another Watchman on the Wall program of Southwest Radio Ministry. And here now is Brother Jerry. On this Christmas Eve program, Brother Hutchings talks with Brother Mark Cahill about the most important work Christians have as a result of Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection, evangelism. Mark has a new book that's designed to help you do that. It's entitled The Watchman, which we'll be offering today and tomorrow. Mark was an honorable mention All-American in basketball at Auburn University and has been an evangelist for years. He'll tell more about his ministry in just a moment. But here now is Brother Hutchings. Thank you, Brother Jerry. Brother Mark, I really appreciate your making time for us on the broadcast for today and tomorrow. But there may be someone out there, I, I can't imagine, but there may be someone out there who hasn't heard of your ministry, of what you do. Would you tell us uh, something about it? Hey, Brother Hutchings, it's good to hear your voice again. And uh, hello to all your listeners out there. And it's really fun as I travel the country and do conferences and things and churches. Run to a lot of uh, Southwest radio folks that come up and, you know, heard me at one of your conferences or heard me at on your radio show and stuff. So you guys are still impacting a lot of lives out there. So I just want to say hello to all your listeners and uh, the new listeners out there and stuff. And it's just uh, Mark Cahill Ministries, markcahill.org. And what we do, uh, Brother Hutchings, as you know, as we did at your East Coast Conference that we got so much feedback on us. We just encourage and challenge the believers uh, to boldly step up and share their faith in Jesus Christ. And as we look at the, the signs all around us that we read you know, every month in your newsletter and stuff, it is getting crazy out here. And this world is getting darker and darker. But what I reminded the church in Iowa is the darker it gets, it's easier for our light to shine. And so we should be excited about the opportunities ahead of us that we get to walk into someone's life, share with them the eternal truths of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the biblical truths that we know to be true, and the only thing that's going to change America is getting back and repenting of these sins and getting back to this knowledge and being those true biblical watchmen on the wall. So as crazy as it looks right now, uh, Brother Noah, I mean, I, I, I see some good things going to happen in the days to come because I think we're going to see some real watchmen stand up. We're going to see some lost people uh, repent of their sins and become born again and saved. So I'm actually kind of excited to see what's going to happen in the coming days. Yes, it certainly is, Brother Mark, because we can hardly listen to a news report or watch a news on TV or pick up a morning's paper that uh, we don't see the uh, signs that uh, Jesus said uh, would happen before he come again, the days of Noah, the days of Lot, and what is happening in Israel and uh, what is happening within the church. We are certainly concerned about some of the things that have uh, happened in the church the last few years. I know we continually encourage pastors to speak out boldly and uh, challenge uh, their congregations to get out and witness and pray for our nation. Because uh, I think unless that happens, I have questions if there's going to be a revival in this land. But in your uh, new book, you challenge every Christian to become a watchman in the days in which we live. Not not just someone who's out there on the mission front, but we live in days when every Christian needs to be a watchman. Brother Hutchings, you are right on the money there. You know, um, I love Ezekiel 33 just as much as you love Ezekiel 33, and that the grand account of stepping up and being the watchman on the wall that warns people in the city trouble was coming, and he would, the watchman would, when he would blow that trumpet, People in the city would prepare for battle, get ready to protect their city, protect their wives, protect their kids, protect their land, and do that. But then Ezekiel 33 continues to move, and it says that our God, our loving, gracious, merciful Father in heaven, takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And that means me as a believer in Jesus Christ, you, Noah, everybody listening, is we can't take pleasure in the death of the wicked either. So our job is to pull the trumpet out and blow the trumpet and warn people 
trouble's coming. And just as I was watching uh, on the Internet when the Israelis took out that Hamas leader and he's driving in his car and you can see the video, he's driving, he's driving, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. Then all of a sudden the bomb hit and the car exploded. And the next thing you know, he was dead, but he was alive on the other side. And my question as I was watching that video was who warned him? Who told him about God and Jesus Christ, who he's going to stand up in front of on Judgment Day and do that? And that's what our job is as believers, is to pull the trumpet out and blow the trumpet and warn people, uh, trouble's coming. I was just in uh, Iowa and had a great talk with this atheist, Luca. He was, a, he was a waiter at a restaurant I was at, Noah, and he wasn't even my waiter. I just kind of struck up a conversation with him, and then he started telling me his beliefs in atheism and stuff. began to talk to him about God and Jesus Christ. He loves to read, so I gave him a book to read on how to prove there was a God and prove the Bible. He was really so thankful. But see, my job was very simple. My trumpet doesn't do any good in the pocket. I have to pull it out and blow it and warn people trouble's coming. And when you read the scriptures, and especially the New Testament, every New Testament believer, it's our job to blow the trumpet and warn people trouble's coming. It's not just the pastors, not just the missionaries. It's every believer's job. When I read the New Testament, I say this in one of my talks, that I see two requirements to share your faith in Jesus Christ, and only two. One, you must be born again, and two, you must be breathing. And that's it, born again and breathing. So your audience knows if they're born again, they can just ask one of their friends if they're still breathing, and if they can answer yes to both of those, then it's our job to be watchmen. And boy, oh boy, does America and people listen to this radio show around the world, we need more watchmen in the world today, and every believer is supposed to be one of those watchmen. Certainly. I was in World War II in the Pacific, and I, I know at night you had to post guards, perimeter of the camp, and if you didn't, if the uh, guard didn't sound the alarm when the enemy was coming in, then everyone in your battalion would be killed. So the same thing is true in the spiritual sense today. We live in times when the enemy is coming in. The message of the devil is so prominent everywhere you see today. So many are being confused, betrayed, misled that as Christians, as uh, Brother Mark says, we need to get out there, sound the trumpet, and save some, if not everyone, while there's yet time. Brother Mark, in the first chapter of your book, uh, you, it's, uh, it's an unusual heading. I haven't heard this phrase in some time, blood-curdling scream. That was an interesting uh, <laughs> chapter title on that one, you know, because it made me think on just what you said. I was just speaking in a city that was devastated by a tornado just a couple years ago. So I asked the church I was at, did the sirens go off? And they told me they did. And I said, were you glad the sirens went off? And they said, yes, we were, because they still lost about seven or eight lives in that town. The town was completely devastated. But so many people's lives were saved because they heard the warning and, Brother Noah, they did something with the warning. See, it's the same thing. Just like when you had sentries outside the camp, they would blow the trumpet, warn people, and then it was our job to get ready for that. So, again, we love warning signs. We, we love it when the tornado siren goes off or we have advanced knowledge of a hurricane because then we can go protect ourselves and do that. And that's what our job is to do is just to warn people trouble's coming. And that chapter... Um, uh, the blood-curling scream, it actually came off of a conversation I had with a gentleman on a plane flight, and believe it or not, uh, his wife was uh, shot and killed by a stalker, and he was shot uh, twice in the encounter. And what happened was he was in his bed when his daughter let out a blood-curling scream, and he came running out of the bedroom, and the stalker was in his house. And so he actually told me he rushed the stalker. He was shot twice. And when he went outside after the encounter, his wife was actually laying face down in the snow, shot and killed. And he looked at me on the flight, and he said, Mark, he said, how can there be a God with my wife who is dead and this man who's alive in a prison in Ohio? How can there be a God? And, no, we had this beautiful conversation back and forth on the uh, plane flight. Uh, gave him one of my books. And uh, at the end of the, end of the plane flight, he, he, he literally did this, Noah. He shook my hand twice, and he said, thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed this. And what's interesting about that was when you have a trumpet, 
you don't have to blow it loud. This man was hurting. He was in a lot of pain because his wife was killed and he was shot, even though it was many years ago. To him, it was like yesterday. But he doesn't get to heaven because his wife was shot and killed. He gets to heaven because when he repents of his sins and becomes born again. So if I care about him, Noah, and care about his soul, then I will want to share with him. And that's really what it comes down to. If you really get down to this, Christians, we need to not care just about people physically when they go through a Hurricane Sandy. We need to care about those souls just as well. And that's where we blow the trumpet and tell lost people about what it means to repent and become born again. And when we do that, we are being these Ezekiel 33 type people that uh, God commands that we are. Yes, and uh, you mentioned uh, tornado warnings, hurricane warnings. Uh, we have warnings uh, of all kind uh, concerning uh, physical protection or uh, getting ready to uh, protect ourselves from harm. Yet Christians, so many uh, church members are Christians. If they see someone out, uh, meet someone, maybe not a Christian, uh, you have to remember that uh, that cr uh, person is on the way to hell, that he's way, uh, on the way to eternal death. And you have an opportunity right there to give him a word, a warning, shall we say. I know at my home we have a tornado shelter, and when the warning goes off, we go get in the shelter. There's an important lesson there for every Christian, that everyone you meet, if you can ascertain uh, whether you're a Christian or not, uh, to try to find out, try to lead them in conversation to reveal of what they believe about God and Jesus Christ. No, you give a you give a great piece of advice to your listeners. I just got an email to the ministry today. I flew in yesterday, sat on the train to go get my luggage. I just start chit chatting with this guy and talking to him a little bit. Went a little bit spiritual stuff on him. Gave him a gospel track, uh, his information, how he can get a hold of me. Well, he shoots me an email today. He said, sir, he said, what you didn't know was I was just having a really rough day. He said, it's so nice to know there's still nice people out there that care about other people. Just think about that for a second. No, I just had his graces of this 22-year-old young man. And John said, I read that little gospel track you gave me. I really would like one of your books to begin to search us out some more. So just as simple as we can warn people with a gospel track, uh, with a conversation on a plane flight. I was just at the in South Bend, Indiana. I was speaking at a Christian college up there. So I went over to uh, the University of Notre Dame to just walk around witness for three, three and a half hours. And I'm a former Roman Catholic, so I really have a heart for Catholics. So as I'm walking around campus, you know, I noticed uh, some boys were just throwing footballs. And so I walked over to them. They came over. We started chit-chatting. And one of the boys had those rubber bracelets. You see everyone wearing those rubber kind of bracelets now. And I said, hey, what are your bracelets for? And he said, well, this one here is for a high school friend who committed suicide. This one here is for one of my high school friends who goes to college and got drunk and fell over a balcony and died. And then he had a third one. So two of his three bracelets had to do with death. Well, we got in this fascinating conversation. His name was Sean. He was just an interesting young man. But he was thinking the good works was going to get him to heaven. So what we did is we warned him and told him, no, sinners need a Savior, and that's what Jesus Christ did. I can't trust my works. I can only trust my Savior who can wash me clean of those sins. And we gave him a book to read. He said, no, 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 I'm going to read this, and I will be in touch. So that's how we warn people, through track books, through conversations, giving a book. But what it means is... I just don't care about you physically. I care about your soul as well. And all of us Christians need to be acting just like that. I was impressed in your book where you uh, mentioned that uh, you pray for every passenger on the plane that you're going to be sitting next to. Of course, I uh, fly quite a bit myself. And I, I know there's always an opportunity on an airplane to witness. I, I remember, uh, I think it was on the last trip I was on, I sat next to a Catholic priest, and he had uh, something on that belonged to some order of Mary. So I said, did you know that Mary was the greatest evangelist mentioned in the Bible? Uh, he said, oh, no, I, I was not aware of that. I said, where? I said, well, you know, at the marriage supper, Mary said, whatever he saith, do it. 
And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So uh, he was quite uh, taken back, and I hope I made an impression on him. No, that's fantastic. No, and what it, what it does, it's Colossians 4, and Colossians 4 says make the most out of every opportunity. And that's exactly what you do, is you make the most out of every opportunity. And so since we travel so much, I always pray for whoever sits next to me on a plane flight. And uh, just the other day, I had a, a lady who was going to a Christian church, but she's also into the spiritual and seeing ghosts and kind of interesting stuff. So we started talking about that. Then she tells me uh, she's uh, at a party with her family, and all of a sudden, her mother is standing directly in front of her, and she literally has a heart attack. Her heart attack, ex- her heart explodes. She falls directly to the ground, dead as can be. And that lady looked at me. She said, I had no clue a human being could die that quickly. Well, then we began to talk about, well, where do we go afterwards that? Okay, and I need to be careful that we don't mess with the demonic side, but we just know who Jesus Christ is. I had an atheist pilot from Delta next to me the other day, and he was, he was pretty hard. He was catching a flight somewhere else. He was pretty hard. And I'm trying there, and he just got his guards up. So I give him the book I wrote, One Heartbeat Away, and he's reading the book before we land. And he looks over at me and says, you know, you're not convincing me. You're not convincing me. And the funny thing, Noel, was, you know, he was just trying to keep the upper hand that, you know, he was more intelligent than me and stuff. But the problem is, and a good thing for your audience to remember is, it's not my job to convince people. Because Romans 1 tells me a creation must have a creator. It has to have a creator. People know deep down there is a God. Our, all, all our job is is to tell them who that is. And so when you did that with the Catholic priest, and I did that with the lady next to me, that's what a watchman does. We just, we just unfold the truth before them, and then as the Spirit draws them, they have to decide what decision they make for Jesus Christ. But that's what a true biblical watchman does. I am impressed with the third chapter in your book. I think it's uh, titled, Hey Stranger, and uh, which you mentioned that 80% those in the book of Acts who were one to uh, Christ were total strangers. You know, that's a, I never thought about that before, but uh, in reading the book of Acts, uh, you're, you're certainly correct. It's absolutely fascinating, Noah, um, that when you really go through the book of Acts and really the whole New Testament, 80% of the witness encounters were to complete total strangers. And it really breaks through the argument, you know, I have to make friends with people first before I can share the gospel. You One, you will never see that. You don't see that with Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4. You don't see it with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, uh, 9. You don't see that. Um, so you have to remember one other thing, too. From a stranger's perspective, strangers love talking to other strangers. And the reason is... Because usually they can tell you anything under the sun, and they know you're going to walk out of their life, and you're not. And then their close friends don't know their business. You see, so they actually, it's actually a safety valve for a lot of strangers to talk to another stranger. And so, for instance, last summer we took 400 middle schoolers and high schoolers in Kentucky. Uh, We went for a fellowship of Christian athletes group, and we went door to door witnessing. In, in this town, we just started knocking on doors and started chatting with people. And you ought to have seen, Noah, 400 young people get on yellow buses and take off across this city and knock on doors. It was absolutely fascinating to watch. But what were we doing? We were walking up to total strangers, getting into conversations, and we teach in the book how to do that. And it doesn't take very long to do that. But because of that, that's how you plant the seed and you warn people trouble's coming. When I was in Iowa, I just took off one afternoon, just grab a bite deep. I started walking around this little, kind of eclectic little town. I walk up to two skateboarders, and they're both named Nick, and they're 18 and 28. We start talking, talking. Well, they both, both wound up being atheists. So I just said, hey, what's the best piece of inf- uh, evidence you have there is no God? We keep talking. Uh, they like to read, so gave one of my books. And as we're talking, Noah, one of the atheists, uh, Nick, the 28-year-old, was an electrician. And he told me, he said, seven of his buddies die just doing electrical work, you know, touching a live wire, hooking up something wrong. And so literally when we talked about life and death, even though he was an atheist, he was very open to it because he's had so much death around him. Now watch, those are complete total strangers. I've never met those guys before. 
But a good thing for your audience to remember is every friend we have today began as a complete, total stranger. Your audience, any member of your audience that's married, at one point in the past, their spouse was a complete, total stranger. So we actually do want to go up and walk, talk to strangers because, one, we get friends out of it. Two, you might even get a spouse out of the deal. But three, that's what you see in the Bible. They walk up to strangers and they warn them about judgment that's going to come up down the road. Yes, certainly. As you bring up, one, one thing about witnessing is, I don't know, it's a reticence or fear that they're going to be rejected or maybe uh, they don't believe their message enough themselves. But I think one of the spiritual deficiencies in most Christian today church member is to speak boldly about the way of salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ to those strangers or those uh, friends who are not Christians. You're right on the money, Noah, and uh, the Bible says to, uh, that Jesus was one who spoke with authority, and they actually are expecting us to speak with authority like we know what we're talking about. We don't need to be used the word if all the time with people. We know we're sinners. We know Jesus died on the cross, and we know he rose from the dead. And we really hit that hard in uh, Chapter 4, how to break through that fear of rejection, because all the surveys to this day still show that the number one thing that holds people back from being bold is they're scared to get rejected. But always remember this, that, that truthfully, they're not rejecting you and I, Noah. They're rejecting our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And shouldn't that hurt our hearts a whole lot more that they want nothing to do with Jesus instead of that they may be rejecting us. I mean, that's really what our world has come down to, is people truthfully hate Jesus Christ when Jesus died on the cross for their sins and for God so loved the world and loved every one of them. And so the more you're out there doing that, we really hit it hard in that chapter as well, is just remember when it comes to witnessing is practice, practice, practice. Share with family and friends. Share with strangers on a plane flight. Go to the mall. Go to a college camp. Just get out there and practice. And the more you practice anything, whether it's shooting a basketball. But on the broadcast today, we're going to start with Chapter 5. But yesterday, you concluded the the program by talking about Chapter 4 on uh, being bold. And I, I think that really is one of the greatest deficiencies in Christians today. I think the news media and uh, others uh, have so cowed down Christians that uh, they seem to be afraid to witness anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. And we have to remember as Christians, uh, Noah, is that uh, we don't belong here. We're just passing through. We're heading to the other side uh, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and be with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and be in the heavenlies and in heaven forever and ever and ever. So it's just like if we were going to take a vacation and go to Disney World, we wouldn't take our car, park it at the first rest stop, put our tent out, put our cooler out, spend a week at the rest stop, and then pack it back up and then drive 30 miles back home. We would, that would be absolutely foolish. We have to remember, we're just passing through. And as we're passing through, we have to stay focused on what really matters. And what really matters is the throne of God. What really matters to God are souls. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. How do I know souls matter to God? The cross is absolute proof souls matter to God. The only question we're ever going to deal with, Noah, do souls matter to me? Do souls matter to everybody in your audience? And what we do in the book, The Watchman, we're already getting feedback from people that some people think it's the best of the three books, but we just got this great feedback from a college kid. He was off at a Christian college, and he was being taught friendship evangelism, friendship evangelism, those got to make friends first. If someone gave him The Watchman. He read the book. He put it down, told a pastor's wife, said, okay. I bought the lie at college. I just read Mr. Cahill's book, and I totally understand. We're supposed to go talk to strangers. Let's go do it. And he was out with this group hitting the streets. So what we teach you in that fourth chapter is just have that want to, but we teach you not to be afraid of these people. We have to answer to God, but they're going to answer to God as well. But then how do you do it? How do you get into these conversations? We teach you all these fun, easy questions, just different ways to strike up conversations with people and stuff. I was in the uh, Albany airport speaking to uh, some cadets from West Point. It really gave me a lot of encouragement and all that we have some really good, young, strong men and ladies that are 
just loved the Lord and they wanted to do military at the same point and they were just challenging them to reach their friends and stuff. So I was flying home, walked up to a guy with a beret. He had a, a beret on. I said, hey, how you doing? I said, I don't see many berets. And he said, yeah, he kind of had it uh, cocked to the side of his head. And I said, uh, it's nice. He said, yeah. I said, I'm actually covering something. Oh, I said, just something. He said, yeah, I have a a brain tumor, and they've done some surgery on my head. I said, how long has the doctor told you you have to live? He said, six months. And I said, well, always remember. I said, doctors aren't always right. And he said, okay, that's a good point. So I said, let me ask you an interesting question. When you were younger as a kid, did you grow up in religious faith or belief or tradition as a child? He said, yeah, I grew up Jewish. I said, now that you're older, I said, is it more important to you or less important? And no, he looked and he said, he said, I know exactly where this is going. He said, and I don't want to go there. I said, well, I said, so do you, I mean, so what do you think happens when you die? Um, since you're, you know, you have to think about it now. He said, I know exactly where this is going and I don't want to go there. So I tried one more time. I said, so do you think Yeshua, Jesus is your Messiah or not? He said, I know exactly where this is going and I don't want to go there. Well, you know, I can't force people to love pizza. I can't force people to love basketball. I can't force people to love Jesus Christ. But if I care about that man, I'm willing to be looking like a fool in his eyes, maybe, okay? But I'd rather be a fool for Christ because I cared about his soul. So I pulled the trumpet out. I blew the trumpet. I shook his hand. I said, hey, I just hope at some point you'll search this out because we're all going to die and do that. But he'll never forget that encounter because he met a man that cared about his soul to do that. And so that's what we all need to do. And that chapter does that. How do you break through the fear of rejection? They're just good questions on how to get started with anybody. Yes, witnessing to a Jewish person, you know, you have to expect some feedback or rejection because they're taught that in school from the first grade on. And I've been to Israel 54 times, and certainly we need to pray for that nation. And that's a good point, because just the other day in Atlanta, I struck up a conversation with three Jewish uh, college-age people, and two were from Tel Aviv, and they had come over here to visit some relatives. So I ran into them at this festival I was witnessing at. We had this great talk, and so I asked them, I said, do you think Yeshua, Jesus, is your Messiah? They said, well, you know, we're actually taught that he's not, but we really don't know. And I said, we start talking about how to know that and stuff. I gave them some literature. And they, and they looked at me and said, we're going to read everything you gave us. We really enjoyed this conversation. And then, of course, bombs start landing in Tel Aviv. And all I can think about are these people that I got a chance to witness to. So now we've been able to pray for them. But you know now they're thinking about life and death. So that's why you blow the trumpet 54 times when you go to Israel and we talk to Jewish people as well. Because you do get some rejection. But I'm also looking for those Saul, the Paul, that are going to get saved and be great evangelists in the days to come. Amen. Brother Mark, chapter 5 in your book is Prayer Changes Things. That's the title. You know, one of the way we come on the air is God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. I think that has been done since 1933 when uh, the uh, Dr. E.F. Weber started this. That's uh, the way he would begin his program, and we continue to do that. Certainly, we know that we need to depend on prayer and commune with the Lord. And uh, we're told that in Philippians and many other places in the Bible. We strengthen ourselves through communion with the Lord. Amen to that. And Noah, when you finally stop playing so much golf and memorize my book, you're going to see in that chapter, I actually stole that line for you. Uh, God is, what is it? God's on his throne and prayer still changes things. And uh, yeah, I loved it so much when I when I heard it and I read it in your newsletter every month and it just... It just hit me hard, and I wanted to make sure when we wrote this book, we talked about the importance of prayer, because when we commune with God, it's moving my heart closer to His and to understand what matters to Him. And of course, we know souls matter to Him, and souls matter to Jesus Christ. And so we want to make sure, as we're heading out and about, that we're praying for God to lead us, direct us, get us into these conversations. And then watch what happens. Just a couple days ago, I was getting ready to go to an airport to fly back home. I just stood at my door and said, Father, um, I'm all yours today. Use me. Give me boldness. Give me zeal. Give me passion today. I have a few books with me. Put a name in every book. And then I said, Father, uh, please use me before I walk out of this hotel. And then I walked out my front door of the hotel. 
sure enough, I get in a talk with a guy who was smoking a cigarette out there. He was a lawyer, and he had grown up Roman Catholic, but kind of walked away from it. But he had a very uh, interesting spiritual experience uh, years ago in his life where he thought he heard the voice of one of his dead uncles and stuff. And we know that's that's demonic that when that happens. But he was open to the conversation. And he looked at me and said, I've, you're only the third person I've ever told this to before. So he was a stranger. We got a chance to warn real quick. He loves to read. Gave him a book. When I walked into the hotel to check out, comes walking out was a young man that I had witnessed to a couple of days earlier working there. He looked at me and said, I'm already reading uh, your book. And, man, it's got me interested. He said, I'm not convinced yet. I said, that's okay. You just keep reading and studying and search for truth, and you'll find it. Ask God to show it to you. He said, I'm going to do that, and I'll be in touch. So you just watch how prayer will guide you. I was up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, speaking at something, and someone told me that Brown University uh, was in Providence. I totally forgot Miss Ivy League school was there, so I found directions to it. I drove over there because it's a very liberal, very anti-Christian place, just a crazy place. So I just wanted to meet some students and stuff. So I pray for God to walk around, witness to people, meet people, get in conversation. I had this fascinating talk with this freshman named Will, and he was from uh, San Francisco who came out to, to go to Brown University. One parent was atheist, one was kind of spiritual. We start talking, hey, what do you believe? He starts a real, real deep thinker, really interesting guy. Then he looked at me and said, no, he said, well, what conclusion have you come to? And bingo. So we got to talk about sin, salvation through Jesus Christ, resurrection, why heaven and hell, and all this. And he was so interesting guy. But see, that's why we just let prayer guide us and lead us, and we make sure at the end of the day when we pray like that, no, as you know this well, then at the end of the day we're for sure that God's going to get the glory and then we're not going to get the glory. You know, Mark, we take it for just common knowledge or belief that the people out there are not interested in their soul salvation. But I think you get right down to it, I think most of them are. They've got to know that this life is not all there is. You just made one of the probably the best statements we're going to hear on the show today. I used to make the assumption, Noah, that people didn't want to talk to me about this subject. And then when I started witnessing, you know what I find? Almost everybody does want to talk about this subject because we do think about life and death. We all get older. We have friends that die. A doctor uses the word cancer with us, so we think about that. We think about when people talk about December 21st, 2012, and the supposed end of the Mayan calendar. We think about things like that. So what I have found, especially as I pray and I walk through life, I'm being honest, I rarely have people who don't want to talk about this. But I'll tell you a story. It's in the book, too. I was in a restaurant. There were some police officers who sat down. So I went over and said hello to them. And uh, uh, I was just, I like to encourage police officers and was going to give them some of my books, but I had run out. So I went to my car to get some books and DVDs for them. The entire time, uh, no, at this table, this one police officer will not look at me. He will not look at me, will not make eye contact. It was crazy. I've never seen it. So when I finish, I always shake hands, shake some hands up. I go to shake his hand. He looks up. He shakes my hand. He nods at me, and that was it. A week later, I get an email from that gentleman. He said, uh, my name is Detective Blissett. Uh, he said, you may remember me. You were in a restaurant, and you came up to our table, and there, there was one uh, policeman that didn't look at you. I was that guy. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know exactly who this man is. I could not forget this guy. Okay, he just stuck in my head, so we were praying for him and stuff. He said, well, he said, I just want to tell you, I'm a little gun shy when people walk up to me because as a police officer, everybody wants something. Hey, can you get me out of this ticket? Can you get my friend out of jail? You know, all that crazy stuff. And he said, but I, I took the two books you gave me in the DVD. I just want to let you know, in the last week, I've read both of those books. I've watched the DVD. I made a commitment to Jesus Christ when I was a kid. But I made sure this week I made a commitment to Jesus Christ as an adult man. I have shared my faith more in the past week than I've done in my entire life. He said, would it be okay if I get a case of your books to give out here to the different people around here at the detective, at the police office? And, of course, I'm shooting him an email back. What's your address, man? We get it to him and stuff. And then he told me this. He said, you know, I'm a homicide detective. And he said, all I see are dead bodies. 
He said, you know, I get so desensitized. I just see murder after murder and dead bodies. I get so desensitized. I said, now I walk up to the scene. No, watch what he says. I walk up to the scene. I see that dead body. He said, my next thought is, where is that soul right now? Where is that person in eternity right now? No, I'm not lying. This Detective Blissett, who at first I thought had no interest at all, literally emails me these crazy stories, how he's witnessing when he goes up to scenes, he's witnessing to other officers, he's giving them all my books and stuff. And so that's what I want to encourage your audience with, is don't make an assumption that people don't want to talk about this. As crazy as this world get, it is, it's getting crazier. But the crazier it gets, people are looking for answers. And we know without a doubt, Noah, you know this, you know without a doubt, we have the only right answer in Jesus Christ. And we are compelled and we cannot, not, not keep him to us ourselves. We're commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what loving Christians do. We want everybody involved with your ministry. Everybody listening to this radio should be those type of loving Christians who go out and share the gospel with uh, lost people who are seeking. They're dying without Jesus Christ. And hell is a real place. We don't want anyone to go there. And that's what a biblical watchman does. Well, you have a chapter in your book, I think, about eternity all the time. Not only for yourself, but also uh, those you come in contact with. You know, we, we get so caught up in football and basketball and the economy and all this crazy stuff that's going on, you know. And if you think about it, the moment we die, I don't even know if we're going to remember any of this crazy stuff back here that we spent so much time on and do that. But I ran into, uh, I was um, at a college campus, and I ran into uh, uh, University of Cincinnati. And that whole chapter, I think about eternal time, is on Acts 17. It's, it's the great chapter of, you know, Paul and Mars Hill, and he's going out and going out to where the people are. Now, we can do events where we invite people to our churches and to conferences to hear the gospel, but many lost people won't come in there. I grew up Roman Catholic. We were taught not to go to anything that was Protestant. We were taught that. You just go to Catholic things only. Well, when we go out, though, to a mall, a beach, a music festival, a college campus, you, that's where you go meet people, just like Paul was doing Acts 17. So I was at the University of Cincinnati. I sat down next to this student and just struck up this conversation. And he was uh, a freshman at the University of Cincinnati. And we started talking about what his studies were and his hobbies and stuff. So then we started talking about eternity stuff, okay, what happens when you die. And he had grown up Roman Catholic, confirmation, all that. He just really wasn't sure. We're talking, we're talking. Noah, all of a sudden, he looks at me and says, you know what? I think about eternity all the time. He'll say he'll just lay in bed and think about what happens when I die. Where am I going to go if I take my last breath? What is it? And so it was unbelievable. When you think no one wants to talk to you, you run into a young man named Paul that thinks about eternity all the time. And we, we must have had 15, 20-minute conversation, gave him a book. He stood up then and shook my hand. He said, thank you so much for coming and sitting down next to me. And so I was thinking about, you know, just even the woman at the well story where Jesus was sitting there and this great conversation happens and the same thing happened at the University of Cincinnati. So remember, a lot of people do think about eternity all the time. That's why we, you, I, want to walk into their lives because Satan's given them all the lies, isn't he? All the different religions, the New Age stuff, you can become a god. Mormonism is the same as regular Christianity. No, that's all lies and stuff. So our job is to walk in and give them truth then watch the Holy Spirit grab their heart as uh, they begin that process of walking to that truth and getting born again and saved. Just before I came into the studio to do this program with you, I had a call from a Muslim who wanted to explain me to explain to him the difference between Islam and uh, Christianity. And much of my time is spent on the telephone witnessing the to those who call in. I can't take every call. If I did, I would do nothing else but stay on the telephone. Recently, uh, I got a call, and they, the uh, operator, or the lady who transferred the call here at the ministry said, this guy really needs somebody to help him. He was in a phone booth. He was a drug addict. He had gotten fired. His wife wouldn't let him come home. He had no money. He had no place to go. 
And he said, What am I to do? Can you tell me what I am supposed to do? Well, I spent 30 minutes leading that fellow to the Lord, and I said, He's the only one that can help you. So that that's just an example of what we get here at the ministry. Also, not only on uh, our broadcast, but we get many, many calls from those who are searching, wanting help. I certainly appreciate uh, Brother Mark's great ministry in enlightening Christians and inspiring them to get out and witness. In chapter 6 of your book, I'm not sure uh, you want me to mention this, and I'm not sure where you want to go with this, it's more blessed to give than to receive. <laughs> well, going back to your story, first of all, you know, one of the things I try to tell people is something very simple. God is not concerned about our ability. He's much more concerned about our availability. If you're available to be used by God, he will use you. I just told a church the other day, the day of your last breath, when you take your last breath, I told you, don't forget these words. Either God is going to have used you down here, or Satan's going to have used you. But you got used. You got used by somebody. And I looked at the audience and said, you ever been used by another human being before? And they nodded their heads. I said, not a good feeling, was it? And they said, no. And I said, that's why I want to make sure at the end of my life that God has used me. And that's exactly what happened to you. Noah, you were available, and then God used you in the conversation with that guy. So that's one of the things we just want to be as available to God. Then watch him just bring people across your path and do that. So what we would do in that chapter is we actually just, uh, we just show you the importance of giving because God uses giving to open up doors sometimes when the door would never open. So we do all kinds of crazy things. Thank you, Brother Mark, for being with us uh, the last two days. Brother Mark has uh, written a new book called The Watchman, which uh, encourages every Christian to be a watchman on the wall in these days in which we live. It will send it to anyone who sends an offering of any amount. If you don't have an offering, we'll send it to you anyway. All you have to do is ask for it because uh, we want everyone to get a copy of this important book. So you can become a soldier for the Lord like Brother Mark has been uh, telling us about on these last two programs. But here now is Brother Jerry to give you the number to call or the address to write. Give us a call at 1-800-652-1144. Write to Southwest Radio Ministries, P.O. Box 100, Bethany, Oklahoma, 73008. Or visit our website on the Internet at swrc.com. The 225-page book, The Watchman, is offered for a contribution of any amount, small, medium, or large. Even enough to cover shipping and handling will help, but if you don't have money to send, we'll get a copy to you on a complimentary basis anyway. Brother Mark's book is that important. Just ask for The Watchman by Mark Cahill when you call, write, or go online. From the book's opening pages, you'll catch the essence of living for Christ in a fresh and powerful way. It's so vital that in these last days we share our faith with lost people who will spend eternity in hell if they don't surrender their lives to Jesus. Can you think of a better time to tell someone about him than the day we celebrate his birth? The two programs in this important series are available on CD for an offering of $14 in the U.S., $15 in Canada. So call, write, or visit the website for your copy of The Watchman. Our staff is off today to be with family and friends, but you can leave a message on the voicemail or call tomorrow. Number is 1-800-652-1144. The mailing address, Southwest Radio, Box 100, Bethany, Oklahoma, 73008. And the web address is swrc.com. A quick reminder to check the Internet website for information on Future Congress 2 in Dallas, January 4th through the 6th, that features such speakers as our own Dr. Larry Spargimino. Details are available through a link on our website. We trust you're having a blessed Christmas and invite you to stay tuned now for a Bible in the News report over most of these stations. Tune in for your Watchman on the Wall program of Southwest Radio Ministries. Merry Christmas!
are above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to Jesus is my Lord, my Master and my King. He has been given authority over everything in this world that is and in that which is to come. It's in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, 21. Are above all principality and power and might and dominion And every name that is named Not only in this world But also in that which is to come Are above all principality and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come Ephesians chapter 1 verse 21